going to tell you about one of the hikes that I really like, and it's in the Steens down in the southeastern corner of Oregon. And you approach it, well, so this is the Alver Desert, which is really an amazing desert. It's a dry lake bed. There are hot springs all over the backside, the east side of the Steens. That was one of them, Alvord. You can stay at this wonderful little place called the French Glen Hotel. We're flying now up toward the top of, this is Google Earth, top of the Steens. And it's the, it's the biggest fault block mountain in the Great Basin. Those were shots from the top of the Steens, 9,600 feet. This is one of the glacier carved gorges called Big Indian Gorge. And uh, my wife and daughter, we hiked in and did a three-day backpack into Big Indian Gorge. And we did not see a soul. This is in the middle of July. We did not see a soul for the whole three days we were in there. Um, it is really, it was beautiful. The wildflowers were blooming. You've got this beautiful U-shaped uh, valley. Um, there are other big glacier carved gorges throughout the Steens and one of them is called the Kiger Gorge. You might have heard of that one. Anybody here been to the Steens? It's, it's a, there's a road to the top of it. The road's like 30 miles long to get to the top of the Steens, but 9,600 feet you saw there was still snow in, in July up there. But the, the Kiger Gorge, another big, beautiful, huge glacier carved valley but the amazing thing about the Kiger Gorge is there are wild horses that live in the Kiger Gorge that are direct descendants from the Spanish conquistadors, Spanish Mustangs that they brought over in the 1600s and it's considered the purest breed of Spanish Mustangs anywhere in the world because of their isolation in the Kiger Gorge. And you can hike into the gorge and, and see the Spanish Mustang, so I just think that's way cool. So that's my representative hike, so I can kind of, you know, y'all don't think I'm such a strange person after you hear me talk. Well, we'll still think that, but thanks for the Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I'm now the uh, director of Ready, Set, Prepare. I do business consultations and I work with local, state, federal governments and all types of organizations on uh, building resilient communities and helping people and in, in communities prepare for disasters. The POD you see up there, that stands for Prophet of Doom. <laughs> And my motto is, be prepared. <laughs> now, you guys, you guys are laughing about this. I don't understand. You know, when it comes to disaster preparedness, men like to get all the food, right? The women go after the toilet paper because she who controls toilet paper in a disaster controls society. Think about it. And here's some examples. This is, uh, in 2010, the magnitude 8.8 .8 subduction zone earthquake off the coast of Chile. This is a grocery store in Santiago, a city of about 6 million people, two weeks after the earthquake. You're not getting any toilet paper there. This is two weeks after the big earthquake in Japan in 2011. Two weeks after the earthquake in Tokyo, a city of 36 million people, the largest metropolitan area on earth. And if you did not have disaster supplies at home, this is what you found when you made it to the grocery store, even two weeks later. This is three days before Hurricane Sandy hit in the Northeast, in New York. And once again, the idea of preparing for disasters is real because you just never know when they're going to happen. And I have priorities. <laughs> and one of my priorities is if I am in a big disaster, I am going to make sure that I have lots and lots of alcoholic beverages um, so that I can get through those really, really long days. Not so. <laughs> 
You know, we've moved into kind of a new paradigm in the United States. The age of the billion dollar disaster. 2011, we had 14 billion dollar disasters in the United States. This last year, 2012, we had 11 billion dollar disasters and one of them, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy alone, has cost so far 65 billion dollars and it's still going up. And we've heard about the hurricanes and uh, hurricanes, the tornadoes in, in Texas and uh, Oklahoma just recently. Horrific events. Big, big disasters. Disasters are become big billion dollar disasters of the new normal in the United States. And it's only going to get worse because we are now concentrating in cities, which makes people more vulnerable and we are moving to more and more dangerous places. Lots and lots more people live at the coast. Lots and lots more people live in the mountains. Um, they live in deep in the forests. And so you're going to see more and more billion dollar disasters. What's that mean for an individual is the resources of the United States become stretched to the limit. You've heard about FEMA running out of money from time to time from disasters. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, they go through the same thing. When they're responding to multiple billion dollar disasters over and over and over and over, what it means for us is we could be on our own. Don't plan on somebody else being there to help you in a big disaster. It's going to be you and your friends and your neighbors. Now, wouldn't it be nice if all disasters could be solved this easily? Relax. I think I've got an emergency sinkhole kit in here somewhere. Oh, oh man, I gotta climb stairs? Forget it. No one stays in the sinkhole. Lousy surface dwellers. So, what seems to be the problem? Well, the problem is we come up with lots and lots and lots of excuses not to prepare for disasters. It's never going to happen to me and my family, so why bother? If it does happen, somebody's going to be there to save me, so why bother? There's nothing I can do about it, so why bother? Or, go away and don't bother me, trying to tell me that I need to prepare. The problem is, our brains are wired this way. We don't like to think about unpleasant things, and preparing for disasters tends to be a little unpleasant. We have to get out of our comfort zone and actually sit down with our families and our friends and say, hey, you know, we've got the potential for something really, really bad to happen at some point. We live in the most media saturated place on earth. We get bombarded from every single angle. And so we keep seeing all these big, big billion dollar disasters and sometimes it just sounds like this. some breaking news, a series of concentric circles have begun emanating from this glowing red dot in the big blue area my water. over my left shoulder. The circles are colliding with multiple green misshapen objects approximately two inches away from the pulsating dot. Joining us now is a concentric circle expert. Can you tell our viewers at home what we are seeing? Yes, we often see colorful round shapes like this when concentric circles spread outward. So, uh, no exception in this case. Let's take a look at this orange, yellow, tan, and blue spherical object. Well, these bands of color are definitely oranger, redder, and yellower than any circles I've seen so far today. Can you tell us how long do you think this might continue? When you're dealing with concentric circles, you are usually dealing with a pattern that repeats itself on and on. So they can continue indefinitely. Is there a chance that these various colored bands could trigger rows of little human being shapes like we saw back in 2004? It's not only possible, it's probable. When you are dealing with colors and shapes of this magnitude, they are often followed by at least a small row of human figures. Now how about those? <laughs> it just kind of washes over us. Wasn't that great? Onion News, best newscasts on, on the planet. We forget that 
We can pretty much experience here any type of natural disaster that can happen anywhere in the United States. Or the state of Oregon averages three tornadoes a year. Go figure that. We live within an active volcanic mountain range, you know, obviously your namesake. But did you know that over the last 4,000 years there have been 57 major eruptions in the Cascades? That's more than a couple of times a century. The last one, 1980, Mount St. Helens has been the most active volcano in the last 4,000 years, so chances are if we see another eruption, and there is certainly a possibility that some of us will live to see another eruption in our lifetimes, it will probably be Mount St. Helens. And we can only hope that the wind is blowing in the same direction that it blew back in May of 1980. And so let the people in Yakima worry about the, you know, the, feet, the half billion tons of ash that were thrown up into the atmosphere. But it begs the question, we live in a place that can experience billion dollar disasters. Do you know where the safest place is for big disasters in the United States is? It's the Pacific Northwest. We have less big disasters than anywhere else. The, the top 10 list of cities is Corvallis, Salem, and then a bunch of cities in, in Washington. Uh, there are like six out of the top 10. There's one city in Colorado and pretty much all the rest of the cities are in the Pacific Northwest. So we don't experience, and that's one of the reasons that people move to the Pacific Northwest is, to, is for the weather. Seriously, <laughs> go figure. Not too hot, not too cold, right? But it's, it's kind of just real nice and there aren't a lot of big disasters. So we get really, really complacent about preparing for any type of disaster. Except, then there's the zombie apocalypse. There's strange things happening up in the Olympic Peninsula these days. So, you know, anything is possible. Just want to keep that, keep you in mind with that. And I, and I do have now um, with me, um, if you want to take a look at it, the zombie survival guide, by the way. So. So, where else in the United States can you walk a volcanic evacuation route in the morning and a tsunami evacuation route in the afternoon? Can't name a lot of places, right? And I've seen these popping up as well. So, just another reason to get prepared, okay? And then there's earthquakes. We live on the ring of fire. The, te the earth broken up into tectonic plates, giant rafts, everything is in constant motion. The Pacific plate is the largest plate on the earth. And where the Pacific plate pushes against North America and South America and Australia and Asia, it's called the ring of fire because the Pacific plate is trying to dive under. It's an oceanic plate and it's heavier than the continental plates. It's trying to dive under all of the continents and that's why it's called the ring of fire. This is where the vast majority of great earthquakes and volcanic eruptions happen anywhere in the world. So tell your friends you're really proud of that. Now you look at this map and, and all the blue stars are where there have been really, really, really big earthquakes. And what do you notice about that? Yeah, there's this giant gap where there hasn't been a big earthquake in a long, long time. And that's called the Cascadia subduction zone. Satellite image. This is kind of interesting. You can see where this is the Juan de Fuca plate and this is the continental North American plate. But you see how smooth it is right out here like on all that? 10,000 years ago that was the coast because the ocean was 400 feet lower than it is now. And so in some places off the coast of, uh, of Washington you'd have to go 30, 40, 50 miles before you could get to the coast 10,000 years ago. That's why you don't find any Native American villages any older than 3,000 years old at the coast because that's when our coastline stabilized was 3,000 years ago. Pretty cool stuff. 
you guys up in state of Washington get a whole lot more earthquakes than we do in Oregon. And you've had some big ones. Um, the 1999 earthquake that hit the Grays Harbor uh, area. You, I'm sure you guys felt that here. And of course, Nisqually in 2001, that was a really nice big shake. Any damage in the Longview, Kelso area? Yes. Really? Yes. Yes, we had stuff fall off of the walls. We had part of our little front is cracked from it. And we had about a 30 second roll right down 14th Avenue from, from that thing. Well, in Portland, I was in an 11-story office building on the ninth floor, and we felt a rumble. This is when I was working for the Department of Geology. A chair went up. <laughs> hey, geologists, something to do, right? <laughs> and except the rumble started, it kept building. So after about 30 seconds, it was still building. And so what did I do? I did not get under the table. I went over to the big picture window. Because <laughs> I wanted to, because this was those, these long rolling earthquake waves. And I wanted to see if the people on the ground were feeling the same thing that I was. And they weren't. If you were on the ground, you didn't feel in Portland. But in a big 11 story office building, it started resonating with these long period earthquake waves. And after a minute, the building actually started swaying back and forth and creaking. And I was thinking, okay, I'm in a state office building. Lois Bitter built this building. <laughs> you, you start to get a little nervous. Well, the earthquake for me lasted about a minute and a half. So 150 miles away, it was 35 miles deep. It was a magnitude 6.8. It did $2 billion worth of damage in the state of Washington. But the state of Washington got lucky because it was 35 miles deep and it, that, that distance damped out all the hard shaking. A similar size earthquake in a much better prepared place than Olympia and Seattle, the 1994, Nisqually, uh, the 1994 Northridge earthquake, magnitude 6.7, did $40 billion of damage in the Los Angeles area because it was only 10 miles deep. So that's the difference. Same size earthquake, deeper earthquake. And what was rupturing was the part of the Juan de Fuca plate that had dived under North America. Juan de Fuca plate used to be called the Farallon plate, largest plate on the planet 150 million years ago and it's been diving under North America all that time and it started to break up into even little tinier plates because that's all that's left and a lot of scientists up until the 1960s didn't realize that we got big earthquakes even into the 1980s it's only in the last 25 years that we have found evidence that because these two plates are pushing against each other, moving at about an inch a year, that we've got a 650 mile long earthquake fault that sits off our coast where these two plates come together. And about 25 years ago, a fellow named Brian Atwater with the University of Washington and the US Geological Survey found the first evidence of the fact that we had the potential to get earthquakes as large as what hit Japan in 2011. These are the largest earthquakes on Earth when they happen. He found the evidence in Sitka bogs and freshwater marshes up and down the Washington coast and a ghost forest off the Copalis River. A ghost forest of huge ancient western red cedars that he took tree ring samples of and they had all died at the same time. Ghost forest. And what they found was that we had the potential for these big earthquakes because they found tsunami sand miles and miles inland and they found that all the trees had died at exactly the same time. It's kind of circumstantial evidence but it continued to build and build and build through the 1990s. So now we know that we have the potential for these really big earthquakes but none have happened in recorded history. We'll talk a little bit about that. But now we've been able to go back about 10,000 years in the geologic record and figure out when these earthquakes have happened. 
These earthquakes are very different than what we think of as like a California type earthquake. How many of you have been through California earthquakes? A few people, right. Hard shaking. The Northridge earthquake, Los Angeles, the, uh, the earthquake that hit San Francisco in 89, those earthquakes lasted 12 to 15 seconds. Subduction zone earthquakes can last up to six minutes. But it's a different kind of shaking. Instead of hard, violent shaking, what you get with these types of earthquakes, because you're moving a huge slab of the Earth's crust, is long period earthquake waves. I'm going to show you some video from Sendai, Japan. Sendai, Japan was at the coast. So it was about 75 miles from where their magnitude 9 subduction zone earthquake ruptured. So imagine Oregon coast, Washington coast. This is the type of shaking that you would see. And you'll notice something about the shaking. People are still in the building, looking around. Things are shaking. Not everything's falling off the shelves. That's all kind of good news. It's pretty darn scary, and it's going to last for minutes and minutes and minutes. But it, here are people in an office building. They're still sitting at their desks, which I think is really bizarre. It's Japan. And it dies down a little bit, right? And then it starts to come back again because it kind of comes in surges, these earthquake waves. And the people just sitting at their desks like nothing's going on. Hey, yeah, it's another earthquake. They do average about 360 earthquakes a day in Japan, so they're used to it. But nothing like this. So we know over the last 10,000 years there have been 20 what we call full margin ruptures of the subduction zone, where the whole 650 miles has ruptured. That's pretty much what happened in Japan to create that magnitude 9 earthquake. This generates magnitude 9 to magnitude 9.2 size earthquakes. It, the equivalent of 16,000 Hiroshima size atomic bombs going off. It's a lot of energy released. That's why that's the magnitude scale is how much energy is released. And the whole thing ruptures. And you get the five to six minute long earthquake. But in just in the last few years, there's been new research by Dr. Chris Goldfinger down at OSU, where he's found just the southern part of the subduction zone ruptures. So just the part off of Oregon and Northern California and, you know, you guys. And us, all of us. And he's found another 10 to 20 times that this has happened. I, I've hedged and say 10 to 20 times. He says definitely 20 times. A lot of USGS scientists say no, 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 only 10 times. But nevertheless, that adds up to 30 to 40 times in the last 10,000 years. That's an average of once every 250 to 330 years. And the last one was 313 years ago. Yeah, oh wow. We're within the window for one of these to happen. Sometimes they can be four or five hundred years apart, but sometimes they can be less than two hundred years apart. Sometimes they come in clusters where you'll get four or five in a thousand years. Sometimes you'll only get a couple in a thousand years. There have been four in the last thousand years. But 30 to 40 events is not enough to make a statistical analysis of averages. So being able to say though that we are within the window for one of these earthquakes to happen at any time is a true statement. And it's a little scary. What's it mean? Well, we've never seen a disaster like this in the United States because when it happens 10,000, 10 million people are affected all at the same time. Everybody from Northern California through Southern British Columbia west of the Cascades is affected by this event. They get the hell shaken out of them. The good news is these earthquakes aren't killers. 
Now that sounds pretty weird, doesn't it? But did you know the Japanese earthquake? What killed all the people in the Japanese earthquake? The 20,000 fatalities, 97% of them were from drowning, from the tsunami. If you took away the deaths associated with the tsunami, you probably would have seen less than a couple of hundred fatalities in Japan from a magnitude 9 earthquake. These earthquakes aren't killers. It's what happens after the earthquake is over that does the damage and does the harm to people. One, because it's going to be hell at the coast because of the tsunami. But two, it's because of the damage to infrastructure. And what do I mean by that? Well, this, yes, this affects you, your friends, and your coworkers, by the way. Um, it means damage to roads and bridges for weeks to months to repair. Highway 101 along the coast ceases to exist and may never be rebuilt, or it may take 10 years to rebuild it. All those big, beautiful bridges along the Oregon coast that you've seen, gone. I-5 ceases to exist as a transportation corridor for its full length through the Pacific Northwest because of damage to roads and bridges. How long it's going to take to reopen that, nobody knows. But if you've got damage to bridges like the one over the Columbia and some of the other major bridges that are going to have to be rebuilt, how long is it going to take to get that up and running? I-84 suffers the same fate because of landslides and damage to overpasses that were built in the 1950s and 60s. So Oregon and Washington effectively will be cut off for immediate help. And it may take weeks to months to get many of the roads open. We will be isolated into our communities, maybe even into our neighborhoods. Um, ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, estimates that in Oregon of the 2,500 bridges or so that they're responsible for, west of the Cascades, about half of them are going to suffer some sort of damage in this event. So gives you kind of an idea. Power lines and losses to power generating uh, stations and capacity. They're probably going to close down all the dams on the Columbia to check them at least. Although the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers tells us they'll all be fine in this earthquake. Yeah, you're right to laugh. But so we lose power generating capacity and the estimates are weeks to months for that. Pipelines. Long span rigid objects don't do well when they start resonating with long period earthquake waves. Same for tall skyscrapers. But So you're talking about water lines, sewer lines, gas lines. All those kind of things are going to take weeks to months. In fact, it's estimated by Williams, the folks that control the natural gas pipeline, that it might take up to a year to get natural gas back into the Pacific Northwest because of the damage. So, yeah, yeah. See, I told you y'all didn't want to hear this stuff. It's pretty amazing. Communications suffer the same fate because they're very, very vulnerable. Well, you got no power. That doesn't do you a lot of good. You may be able to use cell phones for a while because some cell sites have backup generators, but they're usually gas or batteries. They're going to run out after a few hours. So how many of you have ham license? Oh, OK. Well, there's an opportunity. You know, you can get your ham license in a day online. You study, you take the test, boom, you've got a license. You can go buy a, a ham radio that will plug into your car uh, lighter for about 250 bucks. Now you can communicate to pretty much anywhere, anybody on earth. So maybe there's an idea. The hiking club buys some hams and you all start taking some, uh, some, you know, getting your licenses and you'll be able to communicate and stuff. I don't know. First responders end up in the same boat as everybody else in an event like this because they've gone through the earthquake as well. What's their first reaction going to be if they're at home? They're looking at taking care of their family and their neighbors. And if they can get to the office, you bet you they're going to respond. But they're not responding to your house. They're responding to places that really need the help. So. 
what happens is it's you and your neighbors. 95% of everybody that's helped or rescued in an earthquake is helped by their neighbors. Some facts. It's going to shake longer than you can possibly imagine, but it's not going to shake as hard. That's, that's not bad. And your house is probably going to be okay because your house wood frame absorbs that sideways motion that these long period earthquake waves take, uh, create. Chimneys don't do so well. Brick and mortar buildings, older buildings don't do well, but concrete reinforced buildings, steel reinforced, wood frame, they do okay. You're probably not going to have to leave your home unless you're not prepared. And the vast majority of buildings are going to survive. Now, there's going to be damage to hundreds of thousands of buildings in the Pacific Northwest, but it's very rare to see a building pancake in an earthquake like this. So the vast, vast majority of buildings, the vast, vast majority of people will be just fine. But as I said, you're not going anywhere. And nobody really knows how long it's going to take to get the transportation infrastructure back up and running. So, you know, what's going to be the first thing that you think of after the earthquake is over? Okay, I've checked on the kids and pets. I'm heading to the grocery store, right? Everybody is heading to the grocery store because you forgot to get anything except plywood and duct tape. And so you get in your car, you drive down the hill, and uh-oh, I'm in a line with a hundred other cars because there are no lights working, so we're just kind of kind of stumbling through here. And uh-oh, there's damage up ahead. Uh-oh, I've got 50 cars behind me now. I'm not going anywhere. What do you do? You get out of the car, you lock it up, and you walk back home. And that's what happens in big earthquakes. You see it happen everywhere in the world when there's a big earthquake. Giant traffic jams, people abandon their cars, and they just get back and walk home. Ah, come get it, you know, in a week or two. Because these cars aren't going anywhere. So, kind of weird. And the thing that people don't think of with these events is aftershocks. The aftershocks will continue for years. And they'll be big. Magnitude 7s, magnitude 8s. By the way, the uh, USGS um, Office for Earthquake Studies is in Golden, Colorado. The least seismically active place in the United States. If you're nervous about this, that'd be a good place to think about retiring to or moving to. <laughs> because yes, we don't get a lot of big disasters in the Pacific Northwest. Well, joke's on us. We have the potential for one that puts all the others to shame. And intellectually, I get it. I understand it. I am paranoid. I have all this crap that I carry around in my car and at home, and I'm just obsessed with this stuff. Emotionally, I can't imagine that this would ever happen. It's not going to happen to me and my family. I'm an American, right? So you have to kind of get over that and begin to realize, okay, I've got people that I'm responsible for. I've got friends that I need to be able to help, and maybe I can even help my neighborhood and my community. So probably half the room's feeling like this at this point, right? And the other half of the room is starting to feel like this. So I'm going to give you a little bit of hope. Free apps that you can download look at and get information. And the ICE standard will also um, uh, emergency contacts and allergies and stuff. I triage um, answers basic medical questions but can also find the closest medical facilities for you just on your phone. Pets. This is a pet first aid, uh, the best one that's made and it costs a little bit of money, three or four dollars, but worth it. Did you know if you go to a shelter, you, you're separated from your pets in a disaster. You go to the shelter and say, I want Fluffy back. They'll go, oh, okay, do you have proof that you're Fluffy's owner? And if you've got your smartphone, you pop up a picture of you and Fluffy and you say, gimme my damn Fluffy back. <laughs> There's the proof. 
if you don't have that, they're not going to give you your pet back. Unless your pet calls your name out, you know. <laughs> ah, I, I hear him. <laughs> so, now, for the, as I said, for the Luddites in the, uh, in the room, there is what's called the Go Stay Kit. I have an older version called the Ready Kit. And instructions and photos and emergency phone numbers and meta, you can put uh, your copies of your um, prescriptions on here. In fact, you can go to your um, pharmacist and say, I, could you get, print a label of all of my prescriptions so that I can have it in one place? And then you throw that in your emergency kit or you have it on your phone, or you put it in your little go stay kit, and if you end up away from home in a disaster or an emergency, you have to go to a shelter or a hospital, you've got those prescriptions and it's gonna be a whole lot easier. I, we bought a month's worth of all of our prescriptions and put them on our, in our emergency kits, and you can do that as well. You can talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist, and have that happen. That's a really, really good idea in a number of different ways. Number three, visit a website. This is a really interesting website, The Burning House. If you only had a few minutes because your house is on fire, what are the most important things that you would want to save? And people think about that and they take pictures of the things that are most important to them and post them on this website. Well, sit down with your friends. There's a good little intellectual uh, thought process. What are the most important things, if I've only got five minutes to get out of my house, that I want to save? Put them someplace that you can access them. My daughter did this. She took a lot of the things that she likes um, are most important to her, and she put them in a suitcase, and she keeps them under her bed. There's things that she takes out, gets to put back, but she's get the idea. And then finally, it's read this book. And tonight we are going to actually be raffling off a couple of these books. It's called The Unthinkable by Amanda Ripley. And it's, it's, it wakes the reality of there's the potential to be in a disaster. How do you train your brain to respond in a disaster? Tonight we've been looking at the risk. We know the biggest risk that we face is a big, big earthquake. Low probability, really big risk when it happens. But there are things in here that can teach you how to lower the anxiety level so when you're in the event, you can think clearly, how to cultivate resilience, how to create a positive attitude when things are going south on you. But the most important thing in the book is getting to know your neighbor. Because if we're isolated in our communities, it's going to be up to us to help each other. So not only do you have to be prepared personally and with your family, but you need to start thinking about how do I interact with the people in my neighborhood, the people in my community, the people in my hiking club, the people at my church, how can we help our community recover quicker in a big, big disaster? Up oh, and here's the bonus. Uh, I don't sell those, but so I, I brought a bunch of stuff. Most of this stuff I carry in my car. Um, this is this is my emergency kit. <laughs> <laughs> that I carry in my car, in my trunk. Yes, it's got sleeping bag, it's got a tent, it's got 50 yards of plastic sheeting, um, you, you know, you name it. Um, I've got a normal day pack just like normal human beings um, that I take when I'm packing, but um, that's the thing. How many of you have first aid training, wilderness first aid training or some sort of first aid training? Okay, so a few of you. You guys take advantage of this REI thing or get the Red Cross out of Vancouver and take a first aid, wilderness first aid, CPR, AED classes. You guys are out in the wilderness a lot on the weekends, some of your hikes. There needs to be a few people in each group that know this stuff, especially CPR. 
and the classes are easy. They're not that expensive. A lot of times, I would bet that uh, that Cowlitz County Emergency Management probably gets does CPR classes for free. Those kind of things. So look into it. But it's well, well worth taking a few classes to learn how to do that stuff. You know, I carry a, a, a pa expired passport in my emergency kit for identification purposes in case I somehow or other don't end up with my wallet. At least I've got some sort of ID. Here's my extra pair of glasses that I keep in my emergency kit. Just all kinds of really interesting things. A trunk pack with quick clot that I carry with me in my day pack if I'm out someplace and I can one need to staunch a really big wound. Um, you've seen the SAM splints? This is an amazing product that you can create splints out of uh, for broken arms, legs, things like that. And it's a little tiny thing packed right there. I don't know other things here, but um, you get the idea. You can come up and look at this stuff. Uh, so finally, I will leave you with these thoughts. Disasters are inevitable, but they're personal. Whether it's a car accident, a home fire, or a giant earthquake, it's happening to you and your family, and it's local. It's happening to your community. It's the survival part that is the option. And here is a tale of survival from the Pacific Northwest. such thing as yet he is. <laughs> and like my friend the prophet of doom always says, Thank you, everybody. Drawing two names. Yeah, you'll be sleeping good tonight, huh? Yeah, be thinking about taking that uh, five-year vacation to someplace else. Bruce McCready. Ah. And Becky. Big on Bigfoot. Uh, do we want to do questions or just uh, just call it a night? All right. Any questions? Stun silence. You gotta love it. Yes. Um, what about water? And, you know, how much water would you suggest with the toilet paper? Right. Right. So I would I would definitely um, put some water aside. Um, you know, a couple of uh, cases of mineral water from Costco ain't gonna cut it. Um, I would certainly suggest, you know, you can get, you can get big Walmart, uh, REI, you know, six, eight gallon things, 
fill them up. They'll, they'll keep forever. Don't believe the thing, oh, well, your water's going to expire. No, water doesn't expire. You know, you put two drops of chlorine in it, it'll keep for 50 years. So, yes, set some water aside, but also um, there are some really, really nice filter systems now. This one um, fill, it has two uh, five liter bags and it's gravity fed. You put, put dirty water in one of it and it filters itself without having to do any work to the other one. But they're ones that are even bigger than this. This one was a hundred bucks. Um, I use it backpacking uh, for three of us. But there are fill, better filter systems than that. Um, so if you've got a water supply near where you live, then you know, you've got enough water but it needs to be treated. You know, you can also put these little aqua tablets um, in your water too, and they sell those. These are, you know, Coleman things. So, but I'd, I, you, you can get by a 55 gallon drum. You've got water in your water heater. So everybody's got, you know, 40 to 80 gallons of water right there. Um, as soon as the ground starts shaking, you could start filling your tub up, I guess. So, you know, you've got another, you know, 50 gallons or so. Um, but water is one of the things that everybody neglects. Um, they think they've got a little bit of water set aside, and it turns out that they don't. So um, I, would, I would stock up on water. Yes, sir? What about the neighbor's swimming pool? Uh, you, if you, can, you can filter that water. You can't drink it because of all the chemicals in it, but you can filter it. So. There aren't a lot of people up here in, uh, in you know, Longview, Kelso that have a lot of swimming pools. So um, I don't know about that. You know, L.A., where you're from, you betcha. Um, but there aren't a lot of pools um, in, the, in the area. So that's really not a, an option. Okay, so yeah, so they're feeling little earthquakes at your home. Sure, that's certainly possible. Or you, or is your house on a hill? Yeah. <laughs> well, then maybe um, you might want a structural engineer to come out and just kind of check things over. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, solid rock moves just like everything else. But yeah, but you know, Mount St. Helens always has little micro, uh, you know, quakes going on and little clusters of quakes from time to time. And, and one magnitude ones and twos and threes and fours, it's probably the most uh, seismically active area in the whole Pacific Northwest. Um, and it continues to be even, you know, 30 years later um, from the eruption. And that's just typical of a uh, volcano. Mount Hood has the little clusters of uh, micro quakes as well. And they're active volcanoes. So the question always comes up, well, can one of these big earthquakes trigger a volcanic eruption? And the answer is yes, it can. Can these earthquakes trigger inland faults, crustal faults to rupture? And the answer is yes, they can. Can this earthquake and tsunami come all the way up the Columbia? And the answer is we don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of geologists who say, nah, probably not going to get past Tongue Point because the mouth of Columbia is so big. I have a, a geophysicist friend who says, yes, because there are tidal fluctuations at the base of Bonneville Dam, there is absolutely no reason to believe that there aren't going to be big tidal fluctuations and tidal fluctuations all the way up into the Willamette River Basin. So yes, it's possible. There's also an effect in a big earthquake called a siege. When you're in a bathtub and you start sloshing water back and forth, that's a, that's a siege. It's just a little, little tiny siege. So imagine a large body of water, long period earthquake waves, and the large body of water likes to resonate, dance with the long period earthquake waves. And now it's moving with these earthquake waves because the earthquake is lasting for minutes and minutes and minutes. And you're seeing giant waves coming out of the Columbia, both sides as the earthquake continues. In fact, sieches 
can happen anywhere in the world when there is a subduction zone earthquake. The Chilean earthquake in 2010, there were sieges on Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans because the earthquake waves travel through the earth. Sieges happen in, there were sieges happening in p people's pools in like Nebraska or Kansas or someplace. Um, water sloshing out because the earthquake waves are traveling through the earth and the bodies of water begin to resonate. So I hope I'm up on a hill or in a helicopter when all this happens because it'll really be cool to see, um, but really not be cool to have to be part of it. So. What do you think of those little flashbacks that do that friction and then the low firm energy? You have one, don't you? I thought you did. Yeah, we have one. Yeah, I've got, I've got one of these little things yeah. that, uh, yeah, you strike it and. Well, yep. But we have yep. the ones with a little friction. Well, I, I, you know, I have a. I, I have giant boxes of matches, so, so, <laughs> but, you know. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm better prepared than you are. I have the wine cellar. <laughs> I'm a long way from here. <laughs> and there's a lot of bridges to cross. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, you know, I, I, I'd rather live here than in tornado country. I lived in tornado country and that scared the hell out of me. It was just right. And I lived on the Gulf Coast. I lived through a half dozen big hurricanes. Hurricanes are a piece of cake. In fact, I took my family uh, into a hurricane so we could go to Disney World one year. Um, because I knew that one, Disney World was built, they had their own generating plants, the buildings were bomb proof. The, when it, when a hur this is amazing, when a hurricane hits the Disney World area in Florida, Orlando, Disney brings all of their employees' families to the hotels and takes care of them so that the employees will feel like, hey, my family's safe, I can continue to help the guests that were too stupid to leave. Right? Hey, you know what, after, this was 2004, when four hurricanes in a row hit Florida, we went between Hurricane Charlie and when Hurricane Francis hit, we were there. We flew in the day before Hurricane Francis hit. We stayed in the hotel and they wouldn't let us out for a day and a half. After it was over, they started opening the parks back up day by day. There was nobody there. I can never go back to Disney World because it'll be the same. I'll have to see people and crowds and stand in line. And I didn't have to do that after. And the day we were leaving Disney World, we were there for a week. The day we were leaving, the next hurricane was in, coming in and was closing down the airport the next day. So that would I do it again? Yeah, probably not. Um, but, but hurricanes, you know, you get warning and you can get to safety. Tornado, um, bathtubs just ain't cutting it for people anymore with tornadoes. And, and the earthquake. I don't have to think about it because it hasn't happened. Um, but it's scary. Oh man, you know, you can go to Costco and they have the, the freeze-dried, the Thrive stuff or Mountain House, a month's worth for, you know, a couple of hundred bucks or something. Um, it's easy to stock up on food and, and a lot of the freeze-dried food nowadays is really, really good and you can set it aside. Um, we have cupboards in our uh, garage that's just full of food. You can, get, you can get cheese in a can with a shelf life of 10 years, butter in a can with a shelf life of 10 years, any type of meat that you can think of with, and it'll have a shelf life of 10 to 15 years. So you can have real food as well. Um, what we did it with, our, with our shelves was I strung a little wire about three inches, a couple of wires actually, above the, uh, of the edge of the shelf so that the things, things can't fall off the shelves when things start shaking and all the shelves are bolted to the walls. You ought to be doing that anyway. All your bookcases and things bolted to the walls in your house and latches on your cabinets in your kitchen so that if things start shaking, things aren't going to fall out of your cabinets as well. Just real simple things. Always keep a pair of shoes, a hard hat, and a flashlight under your bed. 
what's the first thing you're going to do if the ground starts shaking? You're going to get up and check on stuff in your house. And what's going to have fallen off? Lots of glass, um, ceramics, you name it. Um, will have fallen on the floor, so you're really going to want to do that. How many of you have a glass picture above you? That'd be a good thing to move. I took my rock collection and <laughs> moved it someplace else. How many of you have a plan for your pet? Grab and go kit or an emergency kit for your pet just like you. It's on my website, readysetprepare.org. Um, observations from a survivor from Sandy. Didn't have power for three weeks and the things that he observed. And one of the things was, it's really, really hard to find cat litter three weeks after the, earth, after the hurricane because the you know, transportation supplies have been disrupted. About the pets, they're an important part of the family. I need to have a plan to take care of them. If I have to leave the house, you know what I've trained my cats to do? I take them and I throw them in a, um, a, a, a pillow sack and they fall asleep now. They used to hate it. They used to try, you know, why not just go insane and that, why did you put me in this pillowcase? Well, now I can put my cat, cats in a pillow sack, a pillowcase, and they fall asleep because they're used to it. If I have to evacuate my house, I grab my cat, I throw it in a pillowcase, and I just walk out with it. <laughs> Pretty amazing. They, they actually have a thing for cats and dogs called the evac sack that you can buy. I think a pillowcase works just fine and you can spend the money on it, but those are the you know things, I mean, how many of you have trained your cat to walk on a leash? <laughs> um, right, yeah, well, <laughs> I used to have a rabbit that walked on a leash, that was different. Um, but if you have to leave your home for whatever reason, you're gonna take your pets with you. How many of you, how many of you when you go on your hikes have designated somebody your neighbor, one of your neighbors to, if I'm not back by so-and-so, would you please look in on my pets? If you haven't done that, you need to do that today before you go on a hike so that you've got somebody you know and trust with a key to your house that can take care of your pets if anything happens. The bridge on I-5 collapses and now it's gonna be 500 miles I've gotta go to get home instead of, you know, 200, right? And I'm not going to be home the next day. Who's taking care of the pets? Certainly not my 15-year-old daughter. <laughs> hey guys, uh, Bruce and Trudy, thank you very much. Um, under a sturdy desk or table to start with. Um, keep all of your emergency supplies and like I uh, keep mine under a uh, un under my uh, stairwell because that has that's the most rigid place in my house. All right, now I saw a couple of people shaking their heads because you've heard of the triangle of life, right? Who's heard of the triangle of life? Okay, every every time there's a giant earthquake, there's um, uh, email that goes around um, talking about how you should not drop cover and hold because you'll die a hundred percent of the time if you do that. Um, but you should use the triangle of life and what the triangle of life is cre created by this fellow named Doug Kopp is instead of getting under the sturdy desk or table you get next to the sturdy desk or table because the rainbow ponies from Candyland will come down and make a magical space around you and nothing can hurt you. The, the idea the guy had was, you know, you create these, these null spaces where nothing can fall on you. Well, your guess is as good as mine where that space is going to be. It's ridiculous. People die because of the triangle of life. If anybody sees an email or hears somebody talking about the triangle of life, please tell them they are idiots. Um, or that James said, if you don't want to offend them, just say, James said you're an idiot. Um, because uh, every single emergency management and response organization in the world says the triangle of life is really, really dangerous. So, but yeah, sturdy desk or table. If you're, if you're out in the open, stay out in the open. Oh, but I'm, I'm, if, what if I'm in the forest? Yeah, well, 
trees live to be thousands of years old and they all don't fall down in giant earthquakes. So, you know, we've got old growth forests for a reason. Now, there may be limbs falling off those trees, but, but for the most part, the trees aren't coming down. So, yeah, a big open field, you'll be able to see the earthquake waves rolling towards you, which will be kind of a cool sight. <laughs> if the helicopter's landing five minutes later and taking you to safety. That's my deal with my father, who lives in Pittsburgh. If you hear the earthquake, our rendezvous point three days after the earthquake is here, and I want the helicopter there in three days. Good luck with that, huh? Yeah. I, I think uh, a, a little moped or Vespa is not a bad idea. You're not going to be able to drive, but be able to bike. And you you know, the little moped or Vespa that gets 90 miles to the gallon and you can pick it up and get over debris and things like that, that's not a bad idea. It's going to be tough to get out of here and get east. And the problem is once you get east, they've got the same problems that we do. East side of the Cascades is going to have no food, no water, no electricity. They're not going to have any damage, but all of the food, water, and electricity comes from someplace else. So they're in the same boat. Unless you can get to Spokane, it's probably okay. Yes, sir. You didn't talk about tsunami. You know, when it does happen off the coast. You're at Long Beach. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So yes. Yeah, so so. Fifteen to thirty minutes after the earthquake is over, the forty-foot wall of water slams into the coast. I don't. I, I swear to heaven, I don't go on Long Beach. It scares the hell out of me. Um, seriously, because there's only one way in and one way out, and the tallest place, the uh, you know, highest place there is maybe 50 feet high. And there's going to be lots and lots of people standing on that one little spot um, trying to, to so, um, yeah, and, and as, you know, Astoria is a fairly safe place, except that it's all going to slide into the river. Um, but Warrington, Sunset Beach, Gearhart, Seaside, Cannon Beach will cease to exist. Seriously. Um, other communities, Lincoln City, Newport, they have high ground, so parts of them will cease to exist. Uh, have a plan when you go to the coast. Have an emergency kit in your car and know where high ground is. I love to go to the coast. I stay right on the beach, but the thing I do before I check in is I turn around and look at where I'm staying and say, okay, how long is it going to take me to get to 100 feet above sea level? And when I know that, I feel better because I know any time of day or night, I know where I have to be. When I go to the grocery store at the coast, same thing, restaurant, movies, whatever I'm doing. How long is it going to take me to get to high ground? And know that. Um, and the signal is not a tsunami siren because those don't work in an earthquake here. They work great for distant earthquakes. They don't work for a close earthquake because they don't have time or they don't count on it. So when the ground starts shaking and if you're at the coast, you beat feet to high ground. And if you have toilet paper, with you on high ground and there's 20 or 30 other people there, you know, the tsunami lasts 12 to 24 hours. You can sell individual sheets of the toilet paper. You could be a rich person by the time you walked off that hill. <laughs> yeah, if you're smart enough to grab wine when you, when you go up the hill, yeah. But you get the idea. Um, yeah, you... you, you there's lots of nice big houses, though, up on those hills, so that's where I'm planning on staying. Anyway. What about, what about looters? About? Looters. They're, they're going to come after whatever you have. People become incredibly caring and sharing in a big disaster. Um, yes, there will be slight instances, but the instances of looting are exaggerated by, one, the government, and two, the media. So don't believe everything you hear or read. In the meantime, I have a nice handgun that I keep in my emergency kit just in case. And a shotgun under my bed. Um, so, but that's not necessarily just for the earthquake. 
can't hurt. And, uh, you know, I've got this nice axe, too, that I carry with me. It's, uh, yeah, it's a really nice axe. So. And, yeah, and this is my, this is my rock uh, hammer. This is a pretty formidable tool, too. Um, so, pretty funny. Um, any qu I've got uh, some literature up here. You guys are welcome to the, the Together We Prepare and the four simple things you can do this week. A couple of uh, um, uh, reference books that you might find interesting and, and any questions about some of this stuff that I have up here. But thanks a bunch. I kept you all probably way too long. Thank you.